So um, I'm here to talk to you about innovation, and not really just innovation, but how to teach innovation, and how to think about what a career in innovation looks like, and what are the environments that you live in to do it, um, what are the habits of thought, what are the potentials for teaching people to do these things. Because after my career, I can tell you that, that I was really motivated from a very young age to find those places, the, the Venice and the Renaissance, where the great thinkers would collect and put myself in that environment and be surrounded by people who were thinking interesting thoughts. And besides learning to innovate myself, I was also actually, later in my career, I was very purposeful about watching not just how do you learn to innovate, but how do you build all of the environments and tools and techniques to turn people who have no idea how to innovate into innovators by being in those very environments and surrounding them with the mentorship to do it. So let me start today by giving you a brief snapshot of my career and the types of things that I have done. And I'll talk about some of the lessons that emerged along the way. And finally, some strategies that uh, not just uh, learning to innovate, but then helping schools uh, implement some of these practices and learnings from MIT, from NASA, from Caltech, from Cornell, um, and put them into practice teaching people to innovate in the K through 12 levels. So translating those learnings into a broad spectrum of educational opportunities. So let me start with a little bit of taxonomy and, and dive into what I mean when I say or attempt to describe innovation. The key idea, really, is the notion that you can come up with some sort of new idea or new thought and do something useful with it. And here I'm going to differentiate the notion of just what is the creative process where you come up with an idea and say that's one part of it, but there's more. How do you learn to take what you know, what's possible, what's already been built, find some new horizon, explore it, and put that new learning and technology to work. Build another tool to travel farther, see farther, and then have another set of learnings. Um, when I was a child in the late 60s and the 70s, these were photos of the actual magazines that my father brought home. The science fiction era of the day was imagining what would outer space be like. It was the beginnings of the space race with Russia. And so, of course, you imagine what might uh, be on other planets, or how would you get there, or what would you launch, or would we find cities or creatures uh, in various places. But it was the very notion of imagining what was beyond the horizon that you could see, and then figuring out how is it that we get there. And so you think of this kind of unending cycle of imagining from where you stand and from where you see, discovering some sort of new technology or new tool or new capability, bringing that into the process of innovating, so taking that knowledge, building something new to go farther, and then kind of repeating the cycle from your new vantage point, uh, being able to see smaller with a new microscope, farther away with a new telescope, uh, travel farther with a ship, etc. So, of course, in 1968, I was four years old, and my father said, well, Elsa, my mom, would you please get Philip ready? He needs to go see this movie that had just been released. Uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001. My mom says, you're out of your mind. He's only four. <laughs> this yeah. is, what is it, R-rated? Come on. Uh, and my dad at the time said, this movie is going to define who he is. And he was right. Because you know, in the movie, of course, you imagine what it might be like to be on the moon, what an artificial brain might look like, and what it might do. And of course, not a year later, he woke me up in the middle of the night to look at a TV much like this one to watch the first person set foot on the moon. And of course, you know, you have iconic pictures, which some people strangely still don't believe are real, but uh, <laughs> I've spoken to the people who've gone, so I'm pretty convinced uh, <laughs> that, that we actually did get there. And these launches are magnificent uh, testaments to our ability to imagine how do you make something that's so difficult to attain more or less routine regular launches. And of course, now we've got the International Space Station as a testament to that vision of imagining where we might go and, and, and live and be. So it's probably no surprise that my first job out of college was going to work for NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And, and I had the good fortune to join some 2,000 other engineers as a junior member of the technical staff working on sensors. And it was an amazing place. We got to imagine 
unbelievable things that no one had ever seen before. What would it be like when a star actually exploded? So this is one of the artist depictions from the work at Caltech and, and NASA. And so we built computer programs to simulate what would happen when these things would occur from what we knew. And after it collapses into something like a black hole or a neutron star and you've got radiation spewing out the edges, you know, what might that be like? And then how would you simulate something like that? to better understand what could we expect to find? What would we expect to see? And so when my job came around, I was able to work on this one instrument sitting right here on the space shuttle. This is, a camera. This is one of the first digital cameras I ever built. It cost about $2 million to build. Probably a far cry from a $15 part on my iPhone. But that was the first one. That was the first one. And we got to launch it into space, a very difficult environment, and this was a, a mission where this giant instrument here is an ultraviolet telescope. So this was going to be the first time we could see through the dust of nebulas and galaxies to understand how stars were being born uh, in the remote regions of space. And so this was some of the scientific data that came out of the mission, and we could begin for the first time to see these you know, areas of, we come and call them stellar nurseries where new stars were being born in the arms of distant galaxies. And we could look at planetary nebula where you've got a tiny little star in the middle of a ring of exploding gas that had been thrown off. And these were the first time people had seen these things. And so it really was the epitome of imagining what might, what might be out there and building the tool to see it and then verifying your, your thoughts and then of course building successive generations. So we built a second instrument and now, 26 late years later, after that work that we did uh, back in the 80s, you know, now we can actually look at, at the beginnings of this crab pulsar here, and a jet of some energy coming out of it, and a disk accreting around it, almost exactly like we imagined it and simulated it. <coughs> so a brilliant team of scientists deducing what the universe was really like, building the tools to explore it and, and going there. Um, another mission I had uh, the opportunity to work on was the Galileo spacecraft, uh, the mission to Jupiter. Uh, you can see me here right next to the cart in my young, leaner and, and hungry years. Um, <laughs> but, but this too was an amazing mission where this entire thing was designed to fly to Jupiter and cast off this bottom section as a probe to descend into the atmosphere. Um, and it was an amazing mission that, that started on Earth and <laughs> looped around a few times on Venus and uh, shot up past the, the uh, Jupiter. Uh, and rendezvoused in the orbit, and took some of the most amazing images of the storms on Jupiter, uh, saw the first volcano on the moon of Io outside the planet Earth. Um, so just a, just a truly extraordinary mission where, again, you know, 2,000 scientists in California were able to build a robot to explore the far reaches of our solar system. Um, but interestingly enough, when I was at MIT, or not MIT, when I was at, at JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of the interesting observations was that there were about 2,000 scientists working there. And of those 2,000 scientists, all of whom were brilliant, there were really about 10 who did what I would call the, the, the bulk of the out-of-the-box thinking. If there's a problem that no one had ever solved, or an engineering design challenge that no one else could figure out, it almost inevitably would work its way through the organization to one of these 10 people. So that's 10 out of 2,000. And by the way, this is kind of a, a metric that I've found in my business, you know, hiring a few thousand engineers over the course of my career now, that when you look for a new business opportunity to build a new technology or start a new business, the rarest people to find are those who can take raw tools and develop something entirely new that no one else has done before. That creativity, that ability to innovate, from no grounding and take their technical expertise and solve a complex problem without a plan, without prior history, without a roadmap. Those are the people that were the most valuable in the high tech industry and they were the hardest ones to find. And it's not just about engineers. New publishing plans, new marketing strategy, pretty much any discipline. But the idea of doing novel work that wrangled new complexity, that reached new opportunities, those were, those were the most difficult skills to find. And those 10 people, of those 10 at, at JPL, 
Eight of them were from MIT, two of them were from, from, from Caltech, and one was from Carnegie Mellon. Is that up to 10? No. <laughs> uh, but here, when, I, when you get to MIT, it's a pretty amazing place. Uh, the day I walked in the door, um, this is an undergraduate working at the uh, NAT Robot Laboratory and the Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, but actually he's not the highlight of the slide. Uh, the highlight of the slide is this fellow named Herbert up here. And the interesting thing about Herbert was that he existed for only one reason. Well, okay, two. Uh, he existed to get a graduate thesis for a, 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 a electrical engineering student. But besides that, his one mission in life was to search the lab, uh, find uh, soda cans, lift them up to see if they were empty, and if they were, to carry them and put them in the recycling bin. That is all that this robot did. But this was in 1991, and today that computer vision and control technology is at the heart of Google's self-driving car. <coughs> So you can trace the legacy of the development from the very early days of playing with a robot to find empty cans and seeing it translated into something that, that has uh, astounding <coughs> utility for elderly who can't drive themselves any longer and can remain workable in society. Um, it was an amazing place where you walk around and you could see anything from uh, prosthetics uh, that allow uh, people with uh, multiple amputations to run and jog and dance today. Some of you may have seen Hugh Hurst's uh, recent TED talk. I, I recommend it to you if you haven't. Uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, one of my advisors, uh, was the founder of artificial intelligence in its earliest incarnations. Um, this is COG, a robot built by Rob Brooks, Rob Brooks and his group, uh, to understand human interaction and, and computer vision with um, you know, multiple cameras to simulate the high, high resolution fovea of your eye and the, and the lower res resolution periphery. Um, and everywhere you walk around, parks, labs, discussions, collaborations, uh, a very rich environment of exploration. <coughs> um, and being there for a while, you can't help but think, well, I should be able to do this and start a company and build things. And of course, that's what I did after my dissertation. And so my first company was, was this one, MicroDisplay. Um, and the technology was really integrating displays directly with microcomputers. And, and to give you an idea, this is an entire television built on a microchip. Everything. About the size of your pink nail. And uh, you, know, you can see it operating with very, very high resolution color. And in an era where the commercial product looked like this from Nokia, that was a state-of-the-art phone. How, any, how many of you had that one? Yeah. <laughs> one of my favorites, too. Uh, we had designed what now uh, looks, this is the first prototype that we built, but today you might recognize it as something slightly different, where it has become part of Google Glass. Uh, we also did high resolution uh, HD TVs, but, but the core innovation was how do you make it small and tiny and cheap? And interestingly enough, in, 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 as often happens in kind of the march of technology and innovation, <coughs> one realization and one discovery gives you new tools to explore the next thing. And just as with the different spacecraft and the different missions, uh, we had built these very powerful devices that would fit in phones and in glasses. And by the time we had them working, uh, we realized that the internet itself, especially the wireless parts of it, just didn't work well enough to support it. So we started another company called Moby TV. And ultimately that became the distributor of live television to mobile phones. So if you pick up a tele, you know, pretty much any of the mobile phones in the market today, uh, North America, Latin America, uh, much of Europe. It might be branded Verizon Vcast or AT&T Video, but underneath it is Moby TV that's doing all of the transcoding and delivery and distribution. So uh, I think uh, if Comcast and Time Warner merge, they'll be the second largest TV distributor in the United States. Just from that idea. So one innovation leading to the next in a, in a wonderful uh, kind of sequence. And then, of course, uh, through that, uh, you know, we, we got big pretty fast, including the Times Square billboard, and uh, you know, there's the operations center in, in Emeryville, California. If you're around, I can give you a tour. Um, and we built a, built an international network. Uh, we won an Emmy Award, and we even had you know the presidents come and see what we're doing, uh, which is pretty cool. You know, so it starts with three people in my living room saying. You know, whoever solves this data delivery problem when these phones become more powerful is going to have a global business. 
and we made it happen. It's possible. It's possible. So now they've got 20 million subscribers, and you know we can look back and imagine, you know, what might be next. How could we look beyond the little keyhole of the Google Glass display? You know, how could we um, solve this problem of big thumbs and tiny keypads? <laughs> Everyone else mistypes things as much as I do. Yeah? Um, and so, of course, I began thinking of what might be next, and, and I realized that really the next big challenge is neural interface. How do we interface directly to your brain? And it came to me in the shower, actually. I was showering and shampooing and realizing, God, you have to carry all this crap around with you, the displays and the computers and the phones. And, and why do you need an extra display on your eye that you have to peer through? You've got kind of a frame buffer in your head. It's, you know, your visual cortex is already there. You're carrying it around. And then I said, well, of course you are. <laughs> and why can't we use that? And so that it was that moment in the shower, the imagining of what might be different, given the tools that we had today, which, by the way, changed pretty drastically over the last years. This one, in particular, uh, is a really interesting bit of research that came out of Japan. Uh, Tokyo University. This is a, a microscope image of the um, retina of a, um, a zebrafish. And it's a, it's a very interesting retina because the neurons in this eye have been treated with a virus to cause it to produce a protein that will fluoresce when the neuron fires. And so for the first time, we were able to use a microscope to watch neurons, individual neurons, as they fire. And here, over here in the corner, you can see this little paramecium. Uh, as, it, uh, as it swims around, you can see the activity mirrored in the retina of the image. You know, you've got, you've got the opposing um, you know, retina for the far eye kind of optical situation. But you can see the image apply. Now, within nine months, again, the market <coughs> technology progressed to the point where we could see the entire brain of the fish. This is work from Larry and Keller at, um, uh, down in LA where now we're able to see the entire fish's brain as it thinks at the individual neuron level. So this is a profound bit of technology where they're using kind of a benchtop level microscope to see actual thought. Uh, Ed Boyden's group at MIT took it a step further and not only could we watch the neurons fire, but we could also translate a, a different protein production system into the nerves. And where you shine a light on it, you can cause a neuron to fire or be inhibited. And they've now used it to implant artificial memories in mice. So now we have demonstrated all of the physics at the bench level to be able to read to, read from, and write to the individual neurons of brains. And if you go back to my history and, and my career, I've done micro-optics, I've done miniaturization, I've done VLSI microelectronics, I've done the computer science and the data processing and the data delivery and management with Moby. And it was almost like an aligning of the planets for me where I realized <coughs> with a little bit of effort and a little bit of money, I can make something that's about the size of two dimes back to back that has a little transmission coil for power and data, a little camera chip to look at the neurons, little laser devices or LED devices to write to the neurons and make an implantable neural interface that can do some interesting things. So anywhere you want to act uh, on your brain or be acted upon, you can put one of these. This is a cross section of your forearm. So imagine you're an amputee and you'd like to control an arm. Today, the state of the arm are some electrodes attached to the muscles in your chest which when they contract you have a few motions, very simple, so six different motions. But a device like I described is something that you can implant in your bone and it can watch the, the nerve ganglia here. You can strap it around your wrist temporarily uh, and have it watch the nerve ganglia in, in your arm and have full, you know, a couple of million channels of full control where you're really at the you know, Luke Skywalker arm from Star Wars with not just control but sensation. Anywhere you want to put one, be it over your eyes, over the visual cortex, over your auditory cortex. You know, imagine that uh, I could see an image, and if you have one too, you could see it. Or I could allow you to look out of my eyes. 
or I could imagine the thought and have you hear it without saying anything. <laughs> know what your wife is really thinking. <laughs> Um, but everything really will change. Some of it is already changing. And so here, I, I'd like you to you know, imagine with me. So for a moment, imagine that you are the person that's going to determine the next course of research, the next moment of innovation. What would you work on? What would you be worried about? What would you invest in? Your time, your colleagues, your students. The things that we know about are, are pretty obvious, prosthetics. Ears, eyes, voice, those are all happening already, but we're able to move into a new era of precision and, and uh, acuity. Uh, we're already building augmentations for uh, memory and sensing. Uh, there's a, an interesting bit of work at DARPA going on uh, where the hippocampus is, has been uh, severed in a lot of IED um, victims. And they've actually now made a bridge where they can connect across the lesion in the hippocampus and allow the formation of long-term memories where people who have that damage do not function at all. Profound things have come out of that program, but uh, there can be more. What about um, when you think about connecting our brains, not just my implant to a computer, but my implant to a computer, to the internet, to your computer, to your implant, to your brain? That starts to get really interesting. Um, Secondary effects, what happens to language? When I don't need to send you a text information, I can give you a thought. What does that look like? I can send you an image, I can send you a concept, I can send you a memory. These are starting to turn into things that we know how to encode and transfer. Remember this episode, Spock's Brain, from the original series? <coughs> Come on, anyone, Any, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, a couple, a couple Star Trek fans. Uh, we are getting to the point where the action of individual brains and connections are beginning to be within reach of our technology. Still a few years away, but we can kind of put a time horizon on it. We will be able to record what's happening with your brain when we simulate it, and that will also be very interesting. What would you call that? If I have a simulation of your brain, is that you? I want a firewall. <laughs> you guys? Yeah, definitely want a firewall. Uh, what does putting your brains together look like? <laughs> when you can use different, different brains ganged together to do interesting things. Uh, so all of these things are, are really happening. And um, if you would have asked me a couple of years ago, before some of these uh, uh, synthetic biology inventions to light up the neurons came about, I probably would have said, oh, maybe sometime in my children's or their children's lifetime. Um, but with these architectures and a few million bucks, Literally, we could have the first functional prototypes within a few years. And so I, I took this to the government, uh, among other places, and they hired me. <laughs> so not to put too fine a point on it, I joined uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the same agency that funded the development of the internet and stealth technology and a whole series of other things uh, to make sure that this happened ethically within the United States and not elsewhere. Because it is possible and it is happening, and it's happening very, very so you'll hear more about that. But anyway, that's the kind of thing that you can work on. And, and what I wanted to give you an idea in that kind of fire hose introduction was the notion of always thinking about the next thing, always being on the cutting edge, always wondering how could you take your dissatisfaction, as, as uh, Sir Call said, with what's going on today and project that into a better future, and what you could build and what you could empower. Um, so, Beyond doing it myself, now, at each one of those stops of my career, I learned things about how to innovate myself, how to build teams around me that can innovate, uh, and how you could teach people who have no idea what innovation is about how to do it. And I think the, the, the core idea that, that I want you to hang on to as, as we go through this brief description is that, that you need to be in the environment and you need to be mentored with people who are doing it by people who are doing it, to really have an excellent chance of learning not just the hard knowledge, uh, not just the skill with tools, but the social components, the habits of mind, the discipline, the notions of how you communicate in ways that do not inhibit other people from innovating, or yourself. 
how do you structure your environment so that the distractions and the process and so on doesn't get in the way of you coming up with the next thing or helping your friend do it or teaching their child to do it. So let me start by just focusing in on what I would call 21st century skills. Because I'm, I'm going to say that innovation to me, the notion of coming up with these new ideas really is a, is a, a very, very important 21st century skill. And it's, it's, it encompasses a, a lot of different aspects. But, but let me ask you first. Let me just solicit. Shout out from the crowd. Anyone. What's, a, what's an important 21st century skill? Anyone. Collaboration. Collaboration. Absolutely. Another one. Keep coming. Keep coming. Creativity. Creativity. Absolutely. Critical thinking. Empathy. Yep. Empathy. 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 Yep. Empathy. Absolutely. Anything else? Courage. Courage. Yes. Initiative. Initiative. Imagination. 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 All true. All true. <laughs> this is uh, what 14th century. I will contend, and, and actually, often many people will say technology, but I think you kind of get the idea that technology. Innovation, empathy, communication, you know, these are all very, very important 21st century skills. But I'd argue that, that they've been around for a while. And the people who made the brilliant technology and, and societal advances really exercised those skills to good effect to, you know, be the Leonardo da Vinci of, of their era. And in fact, you could go even farther back, you know, the invention of the light bulb, uh, gunpowder, the wheel. Um, I'd say uh, using technology innovation to lash uh, stone tips to wooden spears with sinew and then collaboratively hunt <laughs> for dinner. All of those things have really been around since the dawn of human evolution. So let me, let me refine my question a little bit. So it's not so much about uh, technology, obviously, but what are the uniquely 21st century aspects of innovation that really weren't that important last year. Or in another way, if you think about educating your students, what are the things that we have to do differently now that we didn't have to do last decade to prepare them for the challenges of the future? Well, let me use an analogy. And I've, I've chosen it carefully of the computer. And I think that it, it embodies a, a core idea that's central to the notion of what does it mean to be current. And really, if you look at the different eras of the evolution from the abacus, uh, you know, Pascal's gearing calculator, Babbage's machine, the first paper tapes by IBM, uh, the invention of the transistor, uh, all the way up through, you know, a modern microprocessor in 2012, one of the things you'll notice is that what characterized our society's ability was how complicated a system could we manage. And here you can just count the number of elements that we had to design and hook together to make work functionally. And you know, in our era, the teens of 2000, we're trying to understand what is the um, level of scale and complexity that is current. And our era really is the era of trillions. And it doesn't really matter what field you pick. It could be DNA strands and genetics, you know, gigabytes on a, on a hard drive, transistors on a microchip, connections in a neural circuit, um, interconnections in a social network. Our century, or actually this decade really, this is the decade of trillions. And it's a decade of trillions principally because we have computers that can manage trillions of things. <coughs> So I would argue that one of the most fundamental aspects of 21st century education is teaching our kids to use tools that can manage trillions of things. And really, it's not about technology. It's not about collaboration. It's about doing all of those things, using all of those things as tools to manage trillions of things and learn how to think with those tools and manage the complexities and the annoyances of managing trillions of things. And the interesting thing about it 
is that the way it evolves is, you know, really, if you, if you look at any one person's brain, you can only manage about 150 things at a time, even if you practice and get really good at it, like, you know, Einstein or Feynman or someone like that. So the way we get to trillions is kind of interesting. We, we start with managing about 15 different kinds of atoms to make about, oh, uh, maybe 150 different type of electronic circuits, uh, to make about 150 units, to make 150 different codes, to write 150 different expressions in a software language, and then we've got, you know, Facebook. <laughs> connecting trillions of people. 150 times 150 times 150 times 150, times you, you get the idea. And each year we come up with new abstractions and new complexities to manage the next order of magnitude of complexity. But now you're starting to get an idea of some of the themes that are going to emerge for this as far as education goes. It means that you as school operators and, and, and leaders need to be in a position to have your children working with trillions of things right now. Now let's look at a different aspect. Besides just the level of complexity, I want to talk about the rate of technology development. And this one has a similar story here. I just you know, talked about you know, what is the factor of increase over the course of 400 years. A factor of 10 in 400 years. Oh, in the 80s, we've got a factor of 100x in four years of complexity. And recently, it's about 1,000x in six years. And so what you can see is as we add these kind of compounded components of complexity, one on top of the other, the rate at which we can manage new complexity is growing exponentially. But this has a profound implication for our education policy because if I say, all right, well, we need to be having our students work on trillions of things right now to be current today, and by the way, if we want them to be innovating, you know, they're not innovating if they're back here. You're standing here and you're innovating doing the next thing which hasn't been done yet. So if we want them to innovate, they need to be in this area. If you're a couple of years off because you haven't upgraded your PCs and you're not using the latest operating system or the latest design tools or the latest blogging and communication tools, two years is like a factor of a thousand. You're a thousand times less productive in terms of managing complexity. So that's not innovating, that's kind of following the path and the track that others have set before you. Hmm. Not quite the same. So the rate of innovation is very important. Now, I'll highlight this, uh, this comment here where, I don't know why my slide broke, but uh, you know, I graduated from high school in 1982. And you know, first company, 1995, second company, 2003, third company, 2013. Um, none of these technologies existed when I was in high school and I graduated. So there really was no subject matter that my school could have taught me that would have prepared me directly for this career I mentioned. And in fact, the entire industries didn't exist when I was in high school. So I think there's an even more important notion that I want to highlight as kind of my third most important component of uniquely 21st century schools. And it's related to the rate of technology development. The fact that to be current, you need to use the latest tools. Um, and here, I'll, I'll use a, an analogy I love. I love to dance myself. Um, I'm not that good, but, uh, but here, you know, you go and see a professional dancer, especially one of the really elite ones. And they amaze you with their performance and their control and their ability. But, but there's something that even in the best performances is latent. And unless you think about it, and unless you think about how do you teach someone to do this, it's not obvious. So absolutely amazing to watch. But the astounding thing is that if you take a dancer of this skill level and you show them a movement, they will just watch it once and they will do it. Now when they started, it wasn't like that. Thousands of repetitions, practice, jumping, not high enough, feet together, suck the belly in, shoulders back, chin up. But the key is, you have to learn how to learn. And the latent skill of the professional dancer is not just being good at dance, but being able to pick up a new dance skill and a new movement immediately. Because they have honed with repeated practice how to take up the latest tool and latest technique without frustration or resistance 
or saying, oh my god, another version of Microsoft Word that I have to figure out? Okay, there's some stickers. I know some of us have done it. I've done it myself. But this is the temptation that we have to resist. And the key goal is that for our students to be good at this learning skill, it means that our curricula need to have the component where every quarter they have a new tool that's more powerful than the last quarter's tool. Well, you know, now every quarter there's a new release of blogging software and word processing software and design software. So they should be using the latest tool as it comes out. And the norms of the IT department need to support that. Where they can't say, I'm sorry, we're two OSs behind and it doesn't support the new version. <coughs> Okay, so the demands, the investment in removing those barriers is going to be very important. I'll talk about removing barriers in a minute. So let me kind of articulate at the very highest level what I see as 21st century education in a nutshell, the uniquely 21st century components, is really this notion of being creative in the use of the very latest tools to innovate, to design, to create from those new ideas. And it doesn't matter whether it's technology or engineering or communications, storytelling, the same thing applies. Now, as far as the lessons uh, from MIT and, and what we learned teaching these to undergraduates and graduate students at the you know, universities at the top of the kind of technology and innovation spectrum in the world, um, there's a couple of key distinctions that came about. And, and they've really been highlighted, particularly with the evolution of MOOCs and online learning environments, um, that, that there's a really big difference between, and here I'm just going to develop a little bit of taxonomy with you, the notion of training and education. And I'm going to highlight the difference. One really is the notion of what are the specific knowledge and hard skills that you're learning, subject matter knowledge, how to use a tool. In the, in the kind of manipulation and, and knowing the, the syntax, the grammar of it. Um, and education is more now once you have the knowledge and skills, how do you use them in practicing the wrangling of complexity and solving something that's more complicated and, and bigger and, and, and bolder than you had before. Um, and, and the interesting thing when you start to think of it along that divide is that there are some things that computers are very good at and there's something that they're not. And a couple things begin to emerge. If you want to do a good job at the education part, the mentorship part is absolutely critical. And if you don't have mentors who have innovated, they don't know how to, men they don't know how to mentor that in, in the process. So we'll talk a little bit about that as a barrier in school operation and, and how you know, we help schools solve those kinds of problems. Um, <clears throat> but, but when you think of the MOOCs, they're on the training side. And in fact, if you look at most of the STEM curricula, you know, FOSS, um, you know, pick, pick a you know, Carolina Scientific, um, not to call any particular one out, they all have the common failing that they're very much kind of recipe driven. Known processes, known experiments, did you come up with the right answer at the end? Okay, that's not practice in innovation, that's practice in recipe following. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, here, when you begin to look at the, at the very specific difference in, in calling out the difference between using, the, you know, having the skill and then knowing how to apply it, whether it's you know, learning algebra and then to design something using algebra rather than just solving <coughs> you know, a, a problem in a book, um, or you know, stalling in grammar with communication and so on, I think you get the idea. But the key issue is that, that there's a fundamental realization in the whole MIT process where they have begun ripping out the lecture halls and replacing them with project-based work. And they have found that there's a very key taxonomy where you learn more the farther down the chart you get. It has more value in your process of innovation. Where you begin just by you know, being able to do what now Google can do for you in less than half a second, which is you ask it a question and it gives you an answer. Okay, that no longer has innovative value. Now, how do you take that and synthesize it and solve a problem? Absolutely more value. But even that's not enough. So solve problems, you can Google them and find out how other people have done them. The, the value of that is now declining. So now you rapidly get to say, all right, well, well, if I'm going to hire an engineer at one of my companies, they need to be able to solve, oops, sorry, didn't mean to go there. They need to be able to solve original problems that no one else has solved. Yes, they need to be able to know answers and integrate them and synthesize them, but they've got to be able to do new things. Now, how many of you 
have math, science, computer science, or engineering uh, programs in your school where kids are solving problems that have never been solved before? Show of hands. Okay, that's awesome. But I want to make it all of you. And then, of course, uh, the acme of the chart here is being able to lead a team. And it doesn't mean you need to be in charge of a team. But it means you need to be able to express yourself and have ideas and influence a team and lead them to innovation. And that is where we see the highest value. That is where one person can catalyze the resources of several. So if you look at the school, and you look at the students, and you look at the teachers, how do you empower them? What is it that they need to be able to have a program that does all of these things? Well, obviously there needs to be kind of a base level of technological expertise. Because you need to have someone who's comfortable taking up the new tools without complaining and saying, oh, look, the new release came out today. Now we can manage tens of trillions of things. Let's go. You know, have, have people in China responding to your blog. Uh, it means that the school needs to be current with its computational infrastructure. That's no longer really optional. Uh, for anyone that says we want an innovative environment, it can't be a situation where your teachers won't use the online tools because they're not sure that they have enough bandwidth for everyone in the class to look at whatever or interact with the, with the simulations and so on. Um, and by the way, this has implications on policy of how you operate the computer labs and how you allow teachers and students to update and access software. We'll talk about that in the workshop, if so, you would like to come. Uh, it is interdisciplinary. I want to highlight that my, my presentation, I, I talk about my examples of, of my career in developing technologies, but I want to highlight um, one of the things that made me an, uh, an influential technologist was not just my technical skill. It was the ability to write effectively, the ability to give a presentation, to communicate effectively, and to influence people. <coughs> so developing the communication skills, developing the financial skills, developing the relationships and, and relationship management, marketing and sales, all of these skills, interdisciplinary, are really fundamental. And at the school level, that's even more important where you think about, okay, today we've got math and science and art all in different classes. Teachers rarely collaborate. But some of the better programs that are emerging are beginning to be collaborative efforts where the artist in residence at the school is working with the physicist and the biologist so that when the kids are doing the lab reports, they're not just talking about the plant, they're drawing it. They're figuring out how to communicate the ideas and the diagrams to people, simulate things, run it, linking it to computer science, and being able to draw connections between the different departments. Uh, so some great programs at Thomas Jefferson uh, in Virginia at the high school level uh, are starting to use that kind of connected and, and integrated curricula uh, to very, very good effect. Um, another important idea <coughs> is this idea of the ability to play. And I'm going to touch on this one in a minute, so hold on to that thought for a second. Um, and finally, you know, we talked about the meta skills, so I don't need to revisit that. But, but there's a couple of high level comments that I want to offer as we close in on the hour before I run out of time. Um, structure, process, rules, planning, limits, you know, really anything that causes any kind of anxiety. You can throw tests in there if you like. Um, really, they, they kill creativity. And there's an interesting, um, there's an interesting uh, notion that um, we'll talk about. Uh, in fact, if you have any of you read the, the John Cleese uh, online article about how to be creative, okay, please search for it. Please read it. Watch. The, there's, he's got a couple of YouTube videos. Uh, but one of the notions is that if you are anxious. If you are distracted, your brain, neurologically, does what requires the least amount of energy, which is the things that you already habitually do. So in order to kind of break the habits of thought, break the patterns of the habits of thought, you must be relaxed. 
and you must suppress the habits and be free to explore other ideas. The single most effective way to do that is to play. Um, but, uh, but really, the, the key issue is that the, the notion of play and barriers in the school. What are the barriers to play? What are the barriers to innovation? What are the barriers to creation? Those are the things that, you know, in many ways, all those things that I listed, the planning, the, the structure, these, were, these have been the tools of, of education at scale. And if you don't invest in removing some of those barriers, you can't have an environment where innovation flourishes. And so let's, let's talk about a few of the barriers. I think that the one that I keep revisiting over and over and over again is kind of the expertise barrier, and it relates to the idea of mentorship. Um, and the expertise barrier is a tough one to get across because if I say to you, I want mentorship for my students from someone who knows how to innovate, you know, someone who's just graduated from college now can face a salary, starting salary of $100,000 at any of the leading technology companies. That completely breaks the traditional pay scale at K-12 schools. <laughs> and then if you say, well, I want someone with 20 years of experience who can design the curriculum and manage a few of these people, you're kind of in the 180 to 200K range. Now, you might be able to luck out and get a retiree who doesn't need the cash and is willing to come back and do this for a little while, but generally, they're not on a career track, and they're not someone that you can count on to be there for a long time. So if I was to say, you know, what is the single most impactful thing that a school can do to empower how they create these environments, it's to bite the bullet, understand that this is what the market bears, and figure out a way to <coughs> recruit your board leadership and your parent communities to pay for someone who has these skills. Now, the money is the first step, but there's another important piece, and that is they need to be in an environment where they can innovate. You can pay them all you want, but if you don't let them build a place where they and their students can innovate, they'll leave. So there's a certain notion of freedom and play and openness that these people absolutely require as just part of the environment that they want to be in. And by the way, that's exactly the environment you want the kids in to learn how to do these things. But in a certain extent, you've got to kind of hire them and you kind of got to get out of their way. Because you hire one of these people, things will happen. Things that you thought were impossible, your internet doesn't work, it's too slow, you don't have the right devices, your OSs are out of, uh, you know, are, are, are you know, off sync or not latest in release. Uh, you can't get your makerspace going, or maybe you got a 3D printer and no one knows what to do with it. Uh, you just imported iPads, and it's great, you're a one-to-one -one school, but what does that mean? I guess now we can take tests with the electronic version, we're saving some paper, but what does that mean in terms of <laughs> curriculum? All those things that seem really, really hard are no longer problems once you hire one of these people. And they begin to perpetrate the, uh, and disseminate the, uh, kind of the influence and the norms and the practice and the habits. But... We haven't seen precipitous change happen at a school without a hire like this. And no amount of teacher training or investment in out services uh, or sending people to the D school and having them come back, no amount of that makes significant change, like bringing in someone who's been doing it since their dad turned the TV on when they were four to watch the moon landing and has spent every moment of their you know, life since thinking about these things. You know, you ask me, what do I do with my 3D printer? It's like, oh, I've got 300 ideas. I've got five favorite ones. You know, we can start them tomorrow. You ready to buy it? It's a very different conversation. You show up, and then the next week, they're printing dinosaur bones and assembling them and, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things. But this is probably the single most important thing that you could do. Um, the second one that we see schools fumble again and again and again uh, is something that, that just became part of the culture at MIT and Caltech and NASA. And that is the, the notion of open access, also related to the idea of play. And here, uh, the goal was, if you want to innovate and you can't get to the parts, you can't innovate. If the computer lab isn't open, you're not going to design any software. Now, back in uh, 1977 at Westminster, I was at the Westminster Schools in Atlanta. 
Uh, you know, we had a Wang 3200, tape for tape. There's the machine. It was kind of state of the art in its day. And they had the computer lab open. I started a cottage industry running computer games on, on a teletype. Can you imagine? <laughs> but that was where I started. And then when I was a junior, the woman who was running the computer labs left. A new proctor came in. They said, only homework assignments. And overnight, the innovation ended. No one came to the computer lab anymore. I moved to Georgia Tech after school. Open access, whether it's a maker space or a computer lab or parts, the students should be able to get in in their free time and do whatever they want. Minecraft, computer games, you can encourage them to build stuff instead of play, but don't restrict the playing because you know what? Some of the computer games today, they'll learn more 21st century skills than the whole rest of your curriculum. We're going to have a conversation about that too. <laughs> Open access. John Cleese on the play. Um, you know, this is the AI lab in the 90s. Uh, every year we hosted the AI Olympics. It could be anything from, you know, Nerf Jedi battles uh, to designing computer game contests. And believe it or not, out of these games, just in my, you know, five years that I was there in graduate school, Three multi-billion dollar companies came out of the AI Olympic ideas. Three in five years. Play. And yes, there were a few of the advisors who were like, oh, they're not working on the paper that's due next week. <laughs> but you got a billion and a half company out of it. Not a bad trade-off. <laughs> so play. Open access. Don't lock down your networks. Don't lock your devices. Don't lock the doors. Let the kids in. Let them play. Um, I'm not going to go on any longer because I think we're out of time. Uh, there's a lot more detail that uh, I'm happy to go into as part of the workshop, but I'd like to solicit your views and your ideas and your challenges uh, and hear about your successes uh, and then maybe together come up with some more ideas about how to propagate these things. But really, um, you know, I'd like to see a big change in, in all of you and all of your schools. So I'm here to help. Thank you very much.